So here we go. We're talking about the fact that we need our joy. That joy is our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And that the enemy of our soul wants to come to steal, kill, and destroy whatever he can. And you see at the top of your outlines, Jesus said that emphatically. That the thief, and he is a thief, that means he has no right to be in there. He's a thief. How many of you know that a thief has no right to be doing what he's doing? And if that thief is doing a break, a B&E job, breaking and entering in your home, he has no right to be there and has no right to be taking your things. And through the blood of Jesus and the covenant of Abraham that we've been brought into through Jesus, that healing and all of these things that we're talking about have been made available by the work of Jesus Christ. We are recipients of what God started with Abraham because Jesus has brought us in. We are engrafted. As Paul said, we are engrafted into this magnificent salvation, so powerful, in fact, that the Bible says that in the New, in the New Testament, we have a new and better covenant than they even did in the old. It says this, Peter said, this salvation that we're into, being born again, is so powerful that even the angels themselves desire to look into this thing. That's how powerful it is that what we're involved in. The angels themselves are saying, wow, what is that, Lord, that you've given to these people? We wish we had that. That's how powerful and deep and supernatural it is. And the enemy knows that if the joy of the Lord is our strength, then he wants to use circumstances, he wants to use disappointments, discouragements, and, listen, distractions to then bleed our joy and take that joy because if he can take our joy, he takes our strength. If he takes our strength, he takes away our ability to move forward and then we start to fall down and not be able to get up. And he will use disappointments, discouragements, and don't forget that last one, distractions. He will bring things into our life to get us to look to those things, those events, those happenings, those pressures, anything at all. I've seen people get blessed with jobs supernaturally. They get the job and promptly backslide because they get distracted by all that it takes to do their job and they get involved with their job and they start to travel uh, you know, relentlessly and all that stuff. And it's very hard to keep up your spiritual strength if you let distractions or responsibilities distract you from what our number one goal is in life, which is what? Spiritual growth and being more like Jesus and growing into his image and likeness. And so even a good thing the enemy can use if he can get our thinking messed up concerning it. I've seen people buy homes, get apartments, and once they do, they backslide. Well, I've seen people say, yeah, but I got a good price on it. Yeah, but if the Lord planted you here, why do you think he'd give you a house in Framingham, Massachusetts? Yeah, but I can drive. Yeah, who are you kidding? The first snowflake. Whoa, I might get caught in the snow. Can't come now. See, we can't come now. And the enemy will start to whisper in your ear, you might get caught in the snow. You better not. That mass pike's a nightmare. And where, whereas before you used to kind of soldier through that, or because now you've gone ahead and purchased something that has displaced you from the place of your planting. But you called it the blessing of the Lord. Well, that doesn't look like a blessing to me. Because once that stuff starts happening and all of a sudden you get disconnected, 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 and then we're, we're used to be every time the doors were open pressing in, now once a month you're here. And that once a month will turn to once a quarter. And then in the name of the blessing of the Lord, you promptly backslide. So what does it mean? That the Lord did something wrong and set you up to fail? No, 
You just did the natural, which is you put an application in, you put a bid in, and guess what? You got the house. It is not a supernatural event to do what's natural and then the natural works. You understand that? The Spirit of God will not always strive with people. Sometimes he tries to whisper, don't buy that, don't buy that, don't buy that. But I want it, I want it. I had a guy tell me that if I'm renting, I'm just throwing money away. But it doesn't mean you buy at any cost. It, you've got to think of the other, think of the peripheral circumstances that can come back to haunt you. But I want a house. I always wanted to be a homeowner. Wait on the Lord, David said. And they buy it, next slide. Why? Because now, God forbid, you miss one day at work and you're going to start to get in arrears on your mortgage. Now you are hostage to your mortgage cost. It's the unseen things. The boiler goes. The roof starts to leak. The grass needs to be mowed. You need a lawnmower. You need this. You need a snowblower. You need this and that. And then the driveway goes. And then, then your windows are shot. You got to replace those. What does the enemy tell you? Take a home equity loan. Yeah. It's a good investment. It'll all come back to you. Trust me. Guess what the enemy's doing? That's right. That's right. That's no big deal. All of America's in debt, as though we should follow our government's lead. God help us. That's the last group bunch I want to lead, uh, follow from. Great. So let's all be homeowners then. You just need to be careful. I have seen people move by a house and promptly backslide. You've got to be careful. Because in the hand of God, everything natural becomes spiritual. In the hand of the enemy, everything natural also becomes spiritual. It all depends on the Lord wants to use things for good. The enemy wants to use natural things for evil. And he will use what is natural to wear you out to take you down. You've got to be very, very discerning. I don't care what kind of deal they're offering you. It's the fine print that bites people in the Netherlands. Now, give someone the interpretation of that, will you? <laughs> Is that next to Ohio? No. <laughs> Just say it's more near the South Pole. All right, no. <laughs> okay. Now, we're going to have enough battles through just the natural discouragements of life and the challenges of life to guard our joy. That's why the Bible says in Proverbs 4, you better guard with all diligence your heart. Because it's that difficult and that strategic. If things go into your heart that the enemy plants, he plants seeds just like God plants seeds. How many of you know that when we give an offering, we're planting a seed? We are planting a seed. The Lord, the Bible says in both Corinthians, that the Lord, when he causes us to retain income from our jobs or just a simply blessing from heaven, guess what? The Bible says that he gives seed to the sower. The Lord gives us seed money to sow as seed so that we keep the cycle going. So if you take seed money and you spend your seed money, you have nothing to sow in your field. Seed money needs to be sown first. Then the bread for the eater comes second. No seed, no wheat, no bread. Lots of gluten. If you're gluten-free, you got to sort that out. That's why the scripture is very clear, very strategic. He's the one who gives seed to the sower and secondarily bread to those who want to eat. No seed, no crop, no bread. So when he allows us to get 
income from, wherever, whatever source we get it from, he said, I want you to use the first portion of it as seed to keep the harvest cycle going. Otherwise, it begins and ends with you. Let's say I get a paycheck and I'm starving to death, right? And let's say I have a piece of land that I could actually grow some crops on and eat from. But instead, I said, no, 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 no. No, no, I don't trust I don't trust the crops. I don't trust the, this earth. I don't trust the rain. I don't trust the... I'm going to take it all and I'm going to buy 50,000 loaves of bread. Then guess what? Before I can even eat it, it all goes moldy. Now what do I have left to buy for actual seed to put in my piece of soil? Nothing. Now I'm going to have a weed salad. Well, I see what some people eat. Oh, man, I don't even understand that stuff. <laughs> I'm all natural. Well, good for you. <laughs> that still looks like it's moving to me. No. Um, this, I thought I heard it holler for help. No. So the devil wants to use the natural things of life. If everything that the enemy wanted to use was overtly spiritual, we would wind up picking up on it. But when he can get us naturally oriented and we lose our spiritual edge, then everything natural in our mind just becomes a cycle of life and we don't realize that everything in the natural, because we are spirit beings made alive to God through Christ, everything in the natural has spiritual implications now because we are major players in this game. You understand that when you said yes to Jesus and were born again, you became part of the army of God. That means you lined yourself up with Jesus on this side of the battlefield. Before you were saved, you were already as a POW in the enemy's camp. Without you even knowing it. You ever see that movie, uh, The Truman Show? If you haven't seen it, check it out sometime. Jim Carrey. He didn't even realize his whole life was a soap opera. <laughs> the way some people are in Hollywood. No, no. So we got to be careful. Number one, what are we going to do when joy comes and it leaks because of these circumstances that come our way? Number one, we've covered this. Never underestimate the power of joy. If you don't know how powerful it is, you won't respect how valuable it is. You don't respect how valuable it is, you won't protect it the way that you should protect it. Hello? Number two, and this is what we got into Thursday night. If you missed Thursday night, please get the CD from this past Thursday. This is what we need to broaden our understanding concerning. Remember, never lose sight of the seasonal nature of life's journey. And the point we were making was this. If you are in a difficult time, that's going to pass. If you're in a great time, I promise you this, some of that's going to pass. And when you transition from good to bad or bad to good, there's always challenges in between. Listen, if you are transitioning from, uh, let's say, a lower level season, a challenging season, a, oh, woe is me season, to a season of breakthrough and breakout, I promise you this, you will have encountered many tests along the way. Before every promotion in God, there comes a test. So he will allow the test to promote you. The devil wants to use the test to sour your attitude, steal your joy, and get the very test that God meant to promote you, to destroy you. Two people going through the same trial. One grows from it, the other one shakes their fist at God and walks away from him. Same test. What's the difference? Perspective and attitude. So here's what I want to lay on you this morning. If you are in a difficult time, here's what you have to kind of say. You have to say, Lord, even though my problem is still here, I thank you that because it's in your hand, it's changing. It may not be changed, but it's changing. Because God never leaves something in a static position. How many of you know that we are either changing upward or we're backsliding and decaying backward? Think about crops on the vine, crops in your, in your field. 
They're either growing to fruition or if you pass the time where they should be harvested in and enjoyed, they just start to rot on the vine. You see, you'll reach the peak moment, then it starts to go the other way. And so, because everything in the hand of the Lord involves us, the Bible says that the steps of a righteous person are ordered, they are established, they're directed, they're set or right or perpendicular by the Lord. And if everything about a righteous person is established by the Lord, the second part of that verse says, and he delights in his way. That means the Lord corrects situations in our lives. He causes the crooked places in our lives to be made straight. And as a consequence of that and along with that, He's involved and he greatly delights even in the smallest details of our life. Why do you think it is that sometimes he blesses you with things that you hadn't even prayed for? Well, that hasn't happened to me. Well, then you better pray for that because it sure happened to me. Maybe the reason why it hasn't happened to you is that you've got to get your attitude straightened out in the first place. You have, to have a, you have to have a right perspective on what's going on here. I want you to just look in the mirror of your life. Look in the, what James says, the mirror of God's word, the perfect law of liberty, and, and ask yourself this question. Lord, or ask the Lord this question. Lord, could you show me today or in this next season how I've contributed to most of my problems? Now get ready to have your butt kicked. So get yourself a good cushion. But we have to, if we're going to make a breakthrough, we have to start taking a great, an accurate personal inventory. And you've got to start taking responsibility. I want you to think about how many silly choices, unwise choices that we can make or even according to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 to 17. Here's what Paul said. We need to walk in this life, not as unwise people, which is to say unbelievers, but as wise people, which is to say people plugged into the Lord, spiritually sensitive, spiritually aware, senses exercised, walking carefully in this life. And he says we need to have our senses exercised, walk circumspectly, which means alertly, not as unwise people, but as wise people, discerning each day what the will of the Lord is. Some people misinterpret that. Understanding what the word of the Lord is is what the King James says. Well, we can't understand the totality of the will of God in one sitting. What he means is if we're going to walk wisely each day, guess what? We're going to get a sliver of understanding concerning the overall will of God for that day. I mean, let me, let me put it to you this way. Does it really matter what a prophet spoke over you or multiple prophets if you're not getting your daily choices right? If you're not getting your daily choices right in the natural and in the spiritual, I don't care what a prophet said. You can take that and a dime won't get you coffee. Just try and sell it at the diner for a cup of coffee. It won't get you one. Everything needs to be linked together and respected in its own right. The natural and the spiritual, are they are interconnected when it comes to the life of the believer because we've been alive now spiritually. We've been made alive through Christ. We are, we are not spectators in this game, in this theater of life, with this cosmic battle, if you will, of good and evil, even though the victory is already won in Christ. We are still major players in what? in affecting, affecting, bringing forth the victory that Jesus won. We do that every time we share the gospel. We're enforcing the victory that Calvary won. Let me give you an example. There have been many times I'm sharing the gospel with someone. Just happened to me the other day in the gym. I'm sharing the gospel with a young man. But this particular thing didn't happen in the gym, but I did get to preach the gospel. But many times I've been sharing the gospel with someone. 
And all of a sudden, this person comes out of nowhere and butts their nose in the conversation. Either intentionally or just <laughs> because they're spiritually clueless and the devil was using them. I didn't say they're demonic, but the devil was using their unsaved fleshly state. And let's say I'm talking, I'm at a poignant moment of sharing the gospel, and then they come in, hey, what do you think about the snow? I want to look at them like, you want to go away right now? Where? Anywhere but here. And I'm telling you, my blood pressure's going up, and I know this is a spiritual thing. This guy is such a spiritual meathead, he doesn't even know what he's doing. And I know he doesn't know. Because he's, he's going to talk about what? And he doesn't know what I'd like to do to him right then. But I want to love him. So I said, hey, look, let's say his name is John. Hey, John, hold on a second. Hey, can we talk about this in a few minutes? Where are you going? And he's thinking, was I going somewhere? Yeah, you are. Hey, listen, where are you going now? <laughs> uh, I don't know why. I said, listen, let me catch up with you over there in just a few minutes. This is kind of private. Okay. You got to find a polite way to get rid of them. The guy won't take a hint, so you got to get rid of him. Some people just don't take the hint. They just don't have social graces. Now, in this guy, it's purely a spiritual thing. I'm not saying he's rude or ignorant. He's just spiritually out there. He's not plugged in. And the devil's using him to try and disrupt the preaching of the gospel. You understand that? I'm trying to enforce the victory of Calvary's cross by sharing the gospel. Jesus, what's the last thing he said in the Great Commission? Go into all the world. Share the gospel. Enforce this victory that I've given you the authority to do. That whoever you share it with, the message is, you don't have to stay bound anymore. Jesus will break this stuff off of you if you will look to him. Who else says that to somebody? Nobody but a Christian. So this is the message I want to get across. To the power of sin and death does not have to reign in your life anymore. Listen to this. Generational curses in your family tree of incest and molestation and drugs and alcohol and pornography does not have to reign in you. Did you hate what went on in your family tree? Hated it. Well, then hate it enough to get the victory over it. And it's only done through Christ. Don't hate the people that perpetrated this evil on you. Hate the evil one that empowered them to do it. If you really hate it, then get filled with a power that can put that stuff down and expose it at every turn. This is what I want to share. You understand that every time you share the gospel, you are bringing light into the darkness. Yes. And you're exposing darkness for what it is. Yes. Let's say someone's been involved in, in some spiritual hanky-panky and Ouija boards and this kind of stuff, and they don't know there's anything wrong with it. Guess what? I'm going to pray that that's going to come up, that whatever needs to come up in a conversation is going to come up. And when it does, I say, well, you know what? You know what, John? <clears throat> You know that, that the Bible has a bunch of things to say about that? What? Yeah, it's really, what do you mean? Oh, it's not good. What do you mean it's not good? It's like, it's like counterfeit. You know, don't you think it's a crime to print counterfeit money? Yeah, of course. Well, sometimes when we tap into the realm of the spirit through counterfeit means, it might look good, it might temporarily sound good, you might trick a few people, but at the end of the day, you're going to prison for a federal offense for a long time. You understand? The devil's trying to play tricks on you, letting you think that you can tap into the realm of the spirit any which way you want outside of Christ. And when you tap in, guess what? You're tapping in alone, and then the devil's going to come for his payment. Because you're opening doors of darkness, baby, that you're never going to be able to handle. 
Once you open those doors up, you'll never close them outside of Jesus Christ. And this guy, and I've said this to people, I'm giving you snippets of a thousand witnessing sessions. And the guys look, I had no idea. Honestly, I had no idea. I, I would never do it. I know that. I know that. And guess what? God knows it too. But listen, we can pray. And your slate can be made clean from all, this, all these violations of God's law. And he can make you a new creation and do great things in your life. He has a plan for you, but the devil hates that plan. Whose plan do you want? I want God's. This is what people usually say. Then you lead them in a prayer. Say, you don't have to do it right in front of a packed house. Find a private place. Use wisdom. Say, hey, can you pray right now? And you're in the middle of stop and shop. Come on. <laughs> now, if that person is bold enough, which is, almost never happens, but if they're, if they're, then you can go for it right there in the produce section. But <laughs> move the lettuce over and, you know. But in most cases, what you want to do is, listen, when we both kind of cash out here, we can go sit in the car for a moment. We can go around the corner of the building or just stand outside. Personal, okay. You understand that? Every time you share the gospel, you're pushing back the darkness. I want you to think of why. If you, if it's nighttime, pitch black, Well, let me back up to the contrast first. If it's daylight and it's bright, and I get a little black duct tape and I put it around my hand, and I just kind of stand at the 50-yard line of a football stadium, right, right, right on the 50-yard line in the center field, and I just hold my hand there, and it's taped with black duct tape. Listen, if I'm in the nosebleed section, I'm looking like, what is, I don't even know what this person has, and I think it might be dark, I don't know. But let's reverse it now. It's pitch black, overcast guy, and it's pitch black. I'm up on the nosebleed section of a football stadium. Guy stands in the middle of the field, and he gets a lighter, just a little lighter. Guess what I'm going to be able to detect from way up there on a pitch black night? The light is more powerful than the darkness. See, you can take darkness, but it won't dispel light. But you bring light in, it dispels the darkness around it. We're supposed to be, guys, children of the light. That wherever you go, you're dangerous to the devil, but you're a blessing to this world. Become dangerous to the devil. How do we become dangerous to the devil? Live for Jesus. Live with passion. Keep your joy filled up. And live with a sense of mission that you're not in this world as an accident going somewhere to happen, but a solution looking for direction from the Holy Spirit. But you've got to start to make some wise choices in your life. Unwise choices will hamstring what the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life. You want to hate something? Don't beat yourself up. That won't produce very much. Hate the evil one and hate the lack of wisdom that led you to foolish choices. That should lead you to cry out for what you've lacked to turn that ship around. James says, if any of us lack wisdom and we ask the Lord in humility, he'll give you the wisdom that you need and he won't rebuke you or scold you or belittle you for having asked. Now, tell someone on the left and the right of you that you are a solution going somewhere to happen. Tell them you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Say, I don't care what you're facing. It's changing. Say, I don't care what you're facing today. It's changing. It's changing for you. Come on, let's stand together.